In the previous four lectures, I've covered three centuries, <coughs> but as you've noticed, have stayed close to Rome. My previous subject um, was the work um, of a Scottish artist working in Rome, Gavin Hamilton, painting a pioneering neoclassical picture. Today we turn to an American artist, Benjamin West, who also traveled to Rome, must have known Hamilton there, then went to London to make a career there as a history painter, the leading history painter in England. Let's start by simply looking at the image on the screen for a minute or so, just observing what's there. The actual painting is about eight feet across and somewhat more legible than what you see on the screen. I think most viewers are struck right away by the grand uh, setting and then by the pale group of people in the center center stage, you could say. The other people, a lot of them, up close and far away on the parapet in the distance, <coughs> are all dressed more or less colorfully, and they're all looking at that central group, bracketing it, pointing to it, reacting to it. At the right are ships with their sails furled, the nearest one is being pulled towards the stone wharf by sailors, directed by a man uh, in military costume. The ships are presumably how the central group of people got there. Others are still on board, including a man at the far right edge um, here, whoopsie, whose uh, red turban and brown skin suggests that he and his shipmates have come from some exotic place. At the left, um, on the wharf, <coughs> and under the portico, is a group of people in attitudes of wonderment, admiration, dejection, piety, and grief. At the very far left edge, there's an adult, or a young person anyway, directing the attention of a child from the excitement of the ships toward the group in the center. In the background, uh, toward the center, by the column, an older child is boosted up on his father's shoulders. Below, two soldiers look on, uh, one of them weeping on the shoulder of the other. The setting is a seaport obviously, a grand one. And you see a stone stage-like wharf with steps leading down. We don't need much experience with architecture to know that the temple fronts and the arcaded terrace here in the background place this harbor in ancient Italy. <coughs> On the parapet are dozens more onlookers. <coughs> one of them, an old man, flings his arms wide in a kind of graphic gesture of despair. <coughs> We've been circling around that group of people in the center, the subject of everybody's attention. They're differentiated from everyone else by their gray-white uh, robes, and picked out from the crowd and the dark area behind them by light that comes in from the upper left somewhere out of the frame. It falls on the foreground figures on both sides and it rakes gently across the central group. It's a group of women who have pulled robes up over their heads and two children uh, who hold onto the robe of the leading woman, one of whom wears, uh, one of them wears a, a golden uh, medallion and the woman holds a big golden vessel. Well, I think you could have worked all this out without help, and probably you did, just with some patient looking. In a moment, I'm going to read the paragraphs from the Annals of the Roman Historian Tacitus that gives Benjamin West the starting point for the picture, 
which he exhibited under the title Agrippina Landing at Brundisium with the Ashes of Germanicus. The story that Tacitus tells, which every educated person in West time knew, um, has elements of heroism, treachery, murder, family loyalty, and it lacks a happy ending. But it has great characters and images. Let me introduce the cast. Uh, first, about Agrippina and some background. Agrippina the Elder was one of the most admired of all Roman women, along with Lucretia, the Roman matron of the earlier era whose self-sacrifice we looked at last week in Gavin Hamilton's picture. Agrippina was the granddaughter of Augustus Caesar, the first emperor, and daughter of the emperor's key subordinate, Marcus Agrippa. She made the most brilliant marriage possible to Germanicus. Germanicus, the adopted son of the emperor Tiberius, who would have success, uh, succeeded him uh, if Tiberius hadn't feared him as a rival. Now, I should say that most of what we know about Germanicus and Agrippina comes from Tacitus, writing 80 years later, who held old-fashioned views about morality. Uh, like his contemporary, uh, Suetonius, uh, Tacitus had strong ideas about Roman Republican virtue, exemplified by Germanicus and Agrippina, and the contrasting vices of the empire, exemplified by the reclusive and depraved Tiberius. Now, Agrippina did something perfectly extraordinary for a Roman wife. After her husband was put in command of Gaul and the armies of the Rhine, she went with him on his military campaigns. And there, in camp, she began to have children. Eventually, she had nine of them. Battles with the barbarians didn't make family life any easier, and neither did the Roman late legions in Germany themselves, who celebrated, who had a, a, a mutiny against the harsh conditions uh, in, in the army that had been imposed by the emperor, who was also there in the field. Uh, Tiberius was wildly unpopular with the troops. Germanicus, however, remained loyal to Tiberius, even when the soldiers wanted him to lead them in a coup, and he rejected their offer with a noble speech that Tacitus carefully records. Tacitus calls Agrippina a woman of heroic spirit, saying that she assumed the duties of general and distributed clothes or medicine among the soldiers, all of which made the emperor suspicious. He figured she had to have a motive for courting the soldiers and for quelling mutiny when he himself couldn't manage to do that. In the year 19 AD, uh, after uh, the victories in Germany that earned him the title Germanicus, uh, he was granted uh, a triumph by the Senate. And he entered Rome through a triumphal arch. There you can see it in the upper left. Mm -hmm. I think so. Preceded uh, by his captives uh, and lots and lots of booty. Tacitus says, the admiration of the crowd was heightened by the striking handsomeness of Germanicus and the chariot, which bore the, his five children. So there is Germanicus uh, with his kids in the chariot. Tiberius, he adds, was resolved to get the young prince out of the way. And for this, he invented reasons. Now, I'm showing you a favorite picture of mine, this immense painting by the Munich history painter Karl von Piloty that shows the triumph from the viewpoint of the Germans. Uh, the proud but uh, defeated German princess um, here, Tusnilda, uh, is in the center and, and, and uh, up here on the dais, uh, a very, make it out here, a very neurotic uh, looking Tiberius uh, in the reviewing stand. So Tiberius was promoted uh, Tiberius was uh, promoted, uh, promoted Germanicus to command the Roman provinces in the Middle East, which is as far from Rome as possible. And there, Germanicus lived with Agrippina and their large family, while he dealt adroitly with political and military troubles. But Germanicus fell afoul of Tiberius' man in Antioch called Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso, a man who shared Tiberius' resentment of this charismatic young man. In the year 19, Germanicus became sick under mysterious circumstances. Tacitus reports himself convinced that Germanicus 
was poisoned by Piso's wife, Plancina, and says that that was the general opinion. On his deathbed, Germanicus tells Agrippina to lay aside her high spirit, in Tacitus' words, and submit herself to the cruel blows of fortune and not enrage people who were stronger than she, meaning the emperor Tiberius. Well, Agrippina had other ideas, as you'll see. I'm showing you the marvelous painting by Poussin of this subject. Uh, Poussin, one of the fathers of the so-called grand manner of history painting that Benjamin West took up and carried on 150 years later. After the funeral of Germanicus in Antioch, in Syria where they lived, Tacitus said, Agrippina, meanwhile, Worn, uh, worn out though she was with sorrow and bodily weakness, still yet impatient with everything that might delay her vengeance, embarked with the ashes of Germanicus and with her children, pitied by all. Tacitus goes on. Here indeed was a woman of the highest nobility, bearing in her bosom the mournful relics of death, with an uncertain hope of revenge, with apprehension to herself, repeatedly at fortune's mercy by virtue of the ill-starred fruitfulness of her marriage. He continues, without pausing in her winter voyage, Agrippina arrived at the island of Corsera, facing the shores of Calabria. There she spent a few days to compose her mind, for she was wild with grief and knew not how to endure. Meanwhile, on hearing of her arrival, all her intimate friends and several officers, everyone indeed who had served under Germanicus, Many strangers, too, from the neighboring towns, some thinking it respectful to the emperor, still more following their example, thronged eagerly to Brundisium, the nearest and safest landing place for a voyager. As soon as the fleet was seen on the horizon, not only the harbor and the adjacent shores, but the city walls, too, and the roofs, and every place which commanded the most distant prospect were filled with crowds of mourners who incessantly asked one another whether, when she landed, they were to receive her in silence or with some utterance of emotion. They were not agreed on what befitted the occasion when the fleet slowly approached. Its crew, not joyous as is usual, but all wearing a studied expression of grief. When Agrippina descended from the vessel with her two children, grasping, grasping the funeral urn with eyes riveted to the earth, there was one universal groan. You could not distinguish kinfolk from strangers or f the laments of men from those of women. Only the attendants of Agrippina, worn out as they were by the long sorrow, were surpassed by the mourners who now met them, fresh in their grief. We'll return to the painting and the action, but uh, let's first turn, turn now to um, Benjamin West and see how it was that he came to paint a picture that remains a work of such fundamental importance for the history of art. Benjamin West was born in, 18, in uh, 1738, 1738 uh, to a Quaker family that kept an inn in rural Pennsylvania, Swarthmore, 10 miles west of Philadelphia, not exactly rural any longer. West got some sort of training locally as a portrait painter, and by the age of 18, he'd not only been exposed to historical subject matter, but had actually tackled an episode from Greek antiquity. This shows the death of Socrates, the philosopher done in by political machinations in Athens, who chose death by poison instead of exile, but who couldn't stop teaching while he took the poison. <laughs> West borrowed the main figures from a French book illustration and freely added characters with uh, expressions of amazement and grief. They were all crudely painted, uh, but arranged in the kind of planar layout used by classicizing paintings, painters like uh, Poussin that was going to be characteristic of his own mature style. Now it's kind of uh, hard on a teenage uh, boy from Swarthmore to make this comparison with uh, Jacques-Louis David's uh, picture of the same subject 30 years later. Uh, David, uh, with two decades of experience as a painter, drew on the same sources to produce the austerity and the discipline that West was just beginning to apply to his painting. West's picture seems to have attracted the attention of William Smith, 
who was the progressive Scottish uh, provost of the University of Pennsylvania, then the College of Pennsylvania, a man who was a classicist and had a library. And you see him here in West's portrait of about 40 years later on the right. Without actually enrolling, uh, West learned quite a lot about ancient history, liberal philosophy and politics, and contemporary literature. The truth about his early years in Pennsylvania, though, is that we don't have any documents to speak of, just some pictures. And we have to rely on a biography of him by a Scottish hack writer called John Galt that was more or less dictated to him by the 78-year-old West, who was by then a grand old man and keen on inflating his own legend. Now, reading Galt on the young West, it's hard to pick apart fairy tale from allegory from actual fact. I guess we, own, we all uh, edit our own uh, life stories, but West was a lot more imaginative than most of us dare to be. Uh, this large pen drawing, if we can depend on its inscription, uh, demonstrates how fast West developed before he left Philadelphia for good in, 18, in 1760. This is Rebecca at the Well, uh, a scene in Genesis where Abraham's servant, uh, Eliezer, uh, here, who was in sent in search of a wife for Isaac, is given water uh, by the beautiful Rebecca, who gets uh, chosen, of course, for uh, Isaac. Um, this is pretty skillful staging. Uh, the figure's still laid out in a shallow plane, but now more convincing, loosened up, even fluent. There's an old inscription at the bottom here that reads, one of the first attempts at his historical composition by Benjamin West while in Philadelphia, 1757. We want to believe it. Having learned all he could in the colonies, West sailed for Italy in 1760, sponsored by a rich Philadelphia merchant, the deal being that West would repay his sponsor by sending back his copies of masterpieces. In Rome, West did what Gavin, Ham Gavin and Hamilton <coughs> had done just a few years earlier. He dropped into a kind of informal master class for ambitious artists from other countries. He was quickly connected uh, with Cardinal Albani at the upper left, a great collector and patron who was just putting the last touches on his new villa. You can see the garden front at the top right. And below, uh, in the drawing, uh, there is the famous loggia where Albani's marvelous changing collection of Greek and Roman statues was shown. Cardinal Albani was his entree to a whole circle of emigre artists and antiquarians that included two Germans uh, who were often there, uh, the first great uh, scholarly connoisseur at the upper left of antiquities, Johann Winkelmann, we met him last in the last lecture, painted by Angelika Kaufmann, a Swiss woman who was also part of the circle, and below Anton Mengs, who was busy painting commissions for the cardinal while West was there at the villa. So we assume uh, West got to watch. This is the most important one of these uh, for the new villa, a large fresco of Apollo on Parnassus with the muses, uh, which was a kind of straightened out uh, remake uh, of Raphael's fresco of the same subject in the Vatican, but with fewer, bigger figures and greater clarity and stability. Mengs uh, taught West painting techniques, something he badly needed. There were other Roman collections for West to study, especially the in the Vatican Palace. There's a famous anecdote in Galt's biography uh, that has this young American artist visiting the Vatican with a group of Italian connoisseurs and encountering this statue, the Apollo Belvedere. West said, my God, how like it is to a young Mohawk warrior. <laughs> that didn't sound like praise to the Italians, <laughs> but West assured them that Mohawks were agile and brave and good with a bow and arrow. And according to Galt, the Italians assured West that, that, quote, no better criticism had been pronounced on the merits of the statue, unquote. In Rome, uh, West painted another claim uh, for the good character of American natives uh, by inventing this little uh, f family tableau on the right. Uh, the painting itself is lost, but this engraving uh, gives you the image. Uh, West paints uh, duty uh, calling the Indian chief 
uh, from the pleasures of family life, and he steps off to war like the noble Apollo. West was not going to forget that pose uh, or that romantic idea of the noble savage, as I'll show you in his most famous picture. Well, the most forceful uh, original painter in Rome in the 18th, 1760s was the Scottish expat Gavin Hamilton. I, I gave a sketch of his career last week when we looked at his greatest surviving picture, the death of Lucretia in the British Art Center. There's no doubt that the two knew each other. As you'll see, Hamilton certainly had an influence on West. Uh, this engraving reproduces the first of a series of six scenes by Hamilton uh, from the Iliad. These are each 12-foot wide canvases of large figures arranged in shallow spaces with eloquent uh, expressions and potent gestures. These represented a return to Poussin's kind of classicism, but with an even more sort of fervent and demanding presence. Rome went from, uh, sorry, West went from uh, Rome up to Florence, to Venice, to Bologna, studying the old masters, uh, copying, adapting their compositions and figures without disguise, um, some of which he was using for the rest of his career, like uh, Raphael's uh, Madonna della Sedia on the left, uh, when he came to paint his own wife and child uh, here on the right. Uh, actually named the child Raphael incidentally. Uh, then he went on to France in 1763, where the hedonist imagery of his French contemporaries was on display at the annual Salon, where he may or may not have gone. Um, if he had, uh, he'd have discovered that there were no history paintings uh, of the newer, more severe, moralizing kind that Hamilton had been painting in Rome. Uh, alongside the many pictures by Boucher and his rivals, like uh, this one of Venus uh, and Cupid on the left, there, there had been changes. There were paintings about love that spoke a new language, classical language, uh, like this scene by Joseph Vien uh, in a Roman hall of women with a basket of little Cupids to sell, uh, based on an ancient Roman wall painting. And next to this uh, playful approach to antiquity, there was the gravity of contemporary middle-class deathbed scenes, such as this one by Greuze. Uh, this was a picture on the left that, despite its heavy dose of sentimentality, moved the critic Denis Den Diderot, who was no pushover, but a cheerleader for moral reform. Uh, Diderot, uh, to write in his review of the Salon, Ought we not be satisfied to see morality competing at last with dramatic poetry in teaching us, in correcting us, and encouraging us to virtue? From Paris, uh, West planned to return home to Pennsylvania, uh, to uh, England, but he never saw Pennsylvania again. He seems to have landed in London just at the right moment in 1763, when many of his powerful friends from back home in Philadelphia had arrived, his financial sponsor William Allen, the academic mentor William Smith, the great landowner Thomas Penn. West traveled around in England, and within a half a year, he took up residence in London and was introduced to other English artists who had been in Rome too, particularly Joshua Reynolds and Richard Wilson. He gravitated to the new Society of Artists, and in the following year, he was exhibiting with the leading English painters. In 1764, he showed how fast he had progressed. Uh, this is his first uh, full-length portrait of Robert Monckton, uh, a military celebrity who'd been second in command to General Wolfe at the Battle of Quebec, uh, more about that battle shortly, and had just recently captured the French island of Martinique West, of course, didn't have to invent a heroic uh, pose for him. Actually, Joshua Reynolds had already done that uh, for another military commander striding forward in the same way. And actually, Reynolds didn't have to invent a pose either, as you know very well. <laughs> these, these kinds of quotations were completely customary. Reynolds wrote this, invention, strictly speaking, is little more than a new combination of those images which have been previously gathered and deposited in the memory. Nothing can come of nothing. Well, allusions to classical sculpture like this not only flattered the subject, but they made the portraits more substantial, 
to the knowledgeable audience that came to see them. The following year, West was working on two pictures that were going to advertise him as a rival to any history painter alive. Both of them are scenes of conspicuous virtue in high places. On the right, uh, the victorious Roman general, Scipio Af Africanus, uh, after his victory was offered, oops, on the right, uh, was offered uh, the, as spoils of war an exquisite girl who was the fiance of the defeated Spanish chief. Scipio refused, and he returned the girl and her dowry to her lover, acting not as a victorious soldier would, but as a responsible commander should. The other painting is the recognition scene uh, in Euripides' play Iphigenia and Tauris, same play that Gluck was soon going to adapt for an opera. Orestes and his friend Pylades, the two men at the right, have been captured and brought to the temple to be sacrificed by the priestess. Pylades offers himself so his friend won't be killed. In reality, the Priestess is Iphigenia, the lost older sister of Orestes, who never knew him. After some touching back and forth, she's just discovered who Orestes is, and this will lead her to managing somehow to save all three of them. Having mentioned Gluck, I should add that West was painting these modest and eloquent compositions just at the time when Gluck was writing the radically simplified Orfeo and Alceste, and also putting his beliefs about operas into words. Um, in the famous preface to Alceste, he uh, called for banishing elaborate ar uh, arias with repeats and florid show-off singing, and he advocated simpler melodies, intelligible words, and a stronger role for the chorus. The public for West's paintings was, and Gluck's operas, was roughly the same, and so it's no sac surprised that changing taste in painting and opera would be parallel and complementary uh, to those, to, to each other, both moving in this period towards greater clarity and dramatic, dramatic emphasis. West's pictures are learned in their subjects and exemplary in their moral lessons, and they conform to the ideals of what Reynolds call the great style. He tells painters to study Raphael's tapestry designs and the idealized way that Raphael depicts the apostles. Reynolds says, he has drawn them with great nobleness. He has given the apostles as much dignity as the human figure is capable of receiving. Yet we are expressly told in scripture that the apostles had no such respectable appearance. None of these defects ought to appear in a piece in which they are the hero. In conformity to custom, I call this part of the art history painting. It ought to be called poetical, as in reality it is. Reynolds is defining poetic license here as against literal truth. So in 1766, uh, Benjamin West has laid claim to history painting in the great style, often called the grand manner and one of the few in England who was doing so, this pretty much guaranteed that he would not find patrons right away, and he didn't. Reynolds himself complained about Englishmen admiring history paintings but not buying them. Reynolds actually had more success at this, than, uh, West actually had more success than, than West at history painting. This is the moment uh, we return to West's first important English commission, which if it didn't make him a star right away, certainly got him all the attention he could have hoped for at the age of 30. After a couple of years of looking for patrons, West met a very important man, Robert Hay Drummond, and was taken up by him. Drummond was the Archbishop of York, the son of a peer, wealthy, worldly, chaplain to George II, a Whig politician, and an educated man with a large library. Galt says that the Archbishop befriended West and that at a dinner one night, he had a volume of the history of Rome by Tacitus brought to him. He read to West the passage about Agrippina and the ashes of Germanicus, passage I read to you, and he asked West to paint the subject for him, says Galt, and, quote, having read the passage, 
He commented on it for some length in order to convey to Mr. West the manner in which he was desirous that the subject should be treated. West went home, said Galt, excited by the passage in Tacitus and by the Archbishop's remarks, and immediately, he says, immediately began to compose a sketch for the picture and finished it before going to bed. Next morning he carried it to Drummond, who was surprised and delighted to find his own conception so embodied in a visible form, requested the artist to proceed without delay in the execution of the picture. We have what appears to be that sketch, um, although West must have pulled an all-nighter to get this far, uh, which, is, which is about 18 inches wide and uh, dated 1766, two years before the date of the finished picture. The sketch has almost everything we see in the Yale picture, uh, but with some interesting minor changes. If you look, for example, at the half-naked sailor poling the boat to shore, in the sketch his motion is actually counter uh, to the motion uh, of the ship. Um, just one second. and counter to the motion um, of the Agrippina group here, but in the finished picture, uh, it's in sync with it. There are more masts in the finished picture to suggest the arrival of more ships, a more important flotilla, and there are architectural uh, corrections uh, everywhere. The arcaded wall of the city is no longer vacant, but has uh, not only arches, but um, is lined uh, with spectators. Uh, a point that Tacitus actually emphasized. Even before he met Archbishop Drummond and learned whatever it was that Drummond wanted him to do with the subject, uh, West was well prepared uh, to paint it. Very few artists had ever treated it, but Gavin Hamilton had. Hamilton got a commission to paint this Agrippina for his English patron, Lord Spencer. This was 1765 in Rome, two years after West had left Rome for England, and the year before his sketch for Drummond, West's solution is actually so close to Hamilton's that he must have known it, but Hamilton's picture didn't get shipped to England for another seven years, so West couldn't possibly have seen it. How, how did he know the composition then? He probably saw an earlier version when he was still in Rome. Now, Hamilton didn't paint large pictures without a client. His habit was to make sketches on spec and then have them on hand to show to prospective customers traveling in Italy, like Lord Spencer or Hamilton. It's uh, likely that he, that's what he did with Agrippina and that West saw Hamilton's sketch. In any case, West took over Hamilton's general layout during his late night charrette for the archbishop, the overall composition with ships at the right, temple at the left, the veiled figure of Agrippina with the urn, the seated female uh, spectator uh, here at the left. All these are similar, but West made big changes. West's colors are much more sparing and sober. In the Hamilton picture, the figures climbed the steps rather meaninglessly. In, in, in West, they move together uh, in a procession. The proportions are different. And there's more space in the West surrounding the figures. And everything is seen from a greater distance, including the magnificent port city that West supplies. The crowds multiplied. West doesn't show the moment of arrival either, but the start of that long, slow trip that Tacitus describes, which you'll hear in a minute, from the seaport all the way to Rome. <coughs> Leading the procession at the left edge, West has added the lictors, the four men uh, who hold the fasces, the bundles of sticks with a hatchet blade that symbolize unity and power. They're upside down, symbolizing the death of someone in authority. West took Gamal uh, Gavin Hamilton's basic idea for the scene and reorganized it, using archaeological information and information and images that he had at hand. One such image was a drawing on the right here that he'd made in Rome of the great relief of a procession on the altar to peace, the peace of Augustus, the so-called Arapakis. 
Uh, here it is uh, with a view uh, in its modern setting, a building by Richard Meyer along the Tiber. The procession of the imperial family to the altar is what gave West his idea uh, for the Agrippina group itself. Here's the key detail of the procession frieze. And um, West's a group of women um, here wearing stolas, that's uh, the women's equivalent of the toga, uh, is rather flattened and compressed in a similar way uh, to the relief sculpture. The odd figure um, who turns away uh, to relieve monotony is echoed here. The monochrome naturally uh, in West's painting suggests stone sculpture too. He also includes the detail of the child uh, here who holds the robe of the parent. And just to identify the children, um, the one holding that golden medallion, uh, wearing that golden medallion, I should say, is the seven-year-old son of Agrippina and Germanicus, nicknamed by the soldiers Little Boots, Caligula, who later became emperor and may well have been as depraved and tyrannical as Tiberius himself. The little daughter is Agrippina the Younger. As the wife of Claudius, she became empress and the mother of Nero. No biographer has very much good to say about her either. <laughs> this appropriation by West uh, of the Arapakis was, of course, not stealing. It, it made the image easier to understand, and it ennobled Agrippina and her family, even reminding the audience that, after all, these were the descendants of the deified Emperor Augustus and no ordinary mortals. And West, as was his custom, appropriated from all the best sor sources. Um, the astonished man uh, seen from the back at the far left uh, in West comes from the Disputa uh, in the Vatican by Raphael. And the pose of the dejected woman uh, next to him is adapted from the most famous depressive of all, uh, Durer's great figure of melancholia. Even the boy climbing up to get a better view has a pedigree that London connoisseurs uh, would have recognized. He's been a stock figure witnessing important events ever since Giotto's uh, Christ uh, entering Jerusalem. Again, there was nothing strange about this borrowing, let, uh, borrowing, let alone reprehensible. Everybody did it. And uh, a few years later, Joshua Reynolds would address young painters by putting a theory behind the practice. According to Reynolds, he who borrows an idea from an ancient or even from a modern artist, not his contemporary, and so accommodates it to his own work that it makes a part of it with not a seam of joining appearing can hardly be charged with plagiarism. Poets practice this kind of borrowing without reserve. But an artist should not be contented with this only. He should enter into a competition with the original and endeavor to improve what he is appropriating to his own work. Such imitation is so far from having anything of it of the servility of plagiarism that it is a perpetual exercise of the mind, a continual invention. If we were intellectual property lawyers, this would probably sound like up-to-date logic, especially in the music business. Um, it, this was entirely, uh, this was the means, um, what Reynolds describes uh, here, by which the tradition of history painting in Italy and France could be continued by English painters. And this continuation was Reynolds' hope, and it became West's great mission and his actual accomplishment. The year 1768 was the making of West's career. Uh, he showed the Agrippina in that year, and his owner, uh, Bishop Drummond, made sure that when George III expressed interest that he got to see it. West brought it to the king, no small feat, brought it to the king who, according to Galt, had, had it moved actually from room to room so he could admire it in different light. The king told West that there was another Roman story similar to Agrippina's the departure of Regulus from Rome, and he asked Mr. West if he thought it would make a good picture. Surprise. West did think so. <laughs> he, 
he, he delivered it uh, the following year. It's a scene of noble self-sacrifice. Regulus, uh, consul and commander of the Romans in the First Punic War, had been taken prisoner by the enemy Carthaginians. He gets paroled on the condition that he return to Rome from Carthage and argue to the Roman Senate that they accept the Carthaginians' terms for peace. He does return to the Senate, but he acts on his conscience and argues against the terms. Then, despite the pleas of the senators, he keeps his pledge and he returns to Carthage and he's executed. So, there's been some debate over who's who uh, in the pictures, but it's been it's argued recently that the Regulus is the man in the center uh, with the people all around beseeching him. And the group on the right, uh, leaving the Senate chamber, are the Carthaginian ambassadors with a scheming Roman called Corvus, who's the villain in several contemporary stage versions of the Regulus story. This would all have a beautiful topical application. The face that West gave to Corvus resembles the notorious John Wilkes, minus the wig, uh, a member of parliament, a writer who'd been lampooning the king bitterly and caused a hot debate over what we would call freedom of expression. So Wilkes turned into the traitor, traitorous uh, Corvus. I mean, the king must have been delighted at that. <laughs> like Gavin Hamilton, Benjamin West made sure that his work was circulated widely by means of engravings. This is a mezzo tint on the lower right by Valentine Green that gave West a wider audience for his work. It was, uh, West was soon appointed historical painter to the king, a brand new title coined for him. He also served as the surveyor of the king's pictures, that is, curator. And for 20 years, he was close to the royal family. He taught the princesses to draw and he had at least 60 commissions from them, not only scenes from Greek and Roman history, but also medieval and modern history and religious subjects too, and portraits. Though, like Joshua Reynolds, he believed that portraits belonged to a lower category of art. Twice later on, West turned back to Agrippina as a subject. He invented a scene here on the right of her wifely piety, uh, grieving and leaning against the urn of ashes with her all too playful children in attendance. And later, uh, on the left, he made a print uh, of an episode in Tacitus that had happened a few years earlier during the struggles by Germanicus to put down the mutiny among the legions in Germany who loathed the Emperor Tiberius. For, his own safety, for her own safety and that of her many children, uh, Germanicus ordered her Agrippina to return to Rome, and she was too proud and refused at first, and then she obeyed, and as she left the camp, there was a great outcry from the mutinous soldiers who so admired her bravery and were so shamed by her sense of duty that they gave up their rebellion. Meanwhile, the other great event of 18, 1768 uh, was that West left the Society of Artists and together with Joshua Reynolds and two others, he founded the Royal Academy, a proper academy on the French and Italian model that would teach a select group of students the study of classical models, would hold lectures, and would present annual exhibitions. The RA gave its first president, Joshua Reynolds, a platform and official recognition for his ideal that history painting be the prime activity of England's best painters. And hung conspicuously in the first RA exhibition in 1769 was the king's new, new painting, The Regulus by West. As the most successful history painter in England, West succeeded Reynolds in 1792 as president of the Royal Academy, the highest honor he could attain. I'm going to give a quick sketch of, of the remainder of West's uh, career, which stretched out for another 40 years or so, and then return to Agrippina. The traditional task of the history painter for 300 years, as we've been seeing, has been to choose subjects from the Bible or classical antiquity, or be supplied by them by a client, and give them meaning and force for a contemporary audience. To help do that, the painter could change the setting to a place familiar to the audience. We began these lectures with Hercules, transported by Antonio Palaiuolo, 
to the Arno Valley of the 1460s. Costumes could be contemporary with the subject or could have a kind of generic or fanciful ancient look. What we haven't yet seen uh, is the history painting, history painter treating recent events and putting the figures into contemporary costume. That was an invention of the 1770s. It widened the horizon for artists and the audience, and it was Benjamin West who showed the way with this painting of 1770. The death of General Wolfe represents the incident 11 years earlier when the British troops under the valiant young General Wolfe uh, finally stormed Quebec and routed the French defenders, and Wolfe was mortally wounded. This was the battle that was going to decide whether the English would capture the prize of the vast Canadian territory from the French. Eyewitness accounts tell what really happened when Wolfe died. He was wounded, he was taken to the woods, he was attended by just a few officers, and died there. What West does is treat his death in a way that he believed it deserved, the way other heroes in the past had been treated, by imagining the dying man attended by his key officers. He set the event out in the battlefield, with the armies engaged and cannon smoke blowing. He gave Wolf a pose that recalls pictures of Christ in the lap of the Virgin Mary. And he introduced a startling note of local color uh, by including a native in pensive pose, a savage who may be noble, as R Rousseau imagined him, but who's also there as a witness to the white man's nobility in death. West gives the actors costumes that don't seem to be costumes at all, but the clothes they actually wore. This was counter to the orthodox view that dead heroes should look like the heroes of antiquity and dress accordingly. This is Joseph Wilton's monument to General Wolfe, the same dead man, of 1772 for Westminster Abbey, and that conforms to this convention. Wolfe is wearing the bare minimum. When his picture was shown at the Royal Academy in 1771, West's originality was obvious. Joshua Reynolds said about the painting, it will occasion a revolution in art. Once the door was open for artists to glorify recent events, especially recent dead heroes, many painters streamed through it, including West's American protégés in London, John Singleton Copley, and John Trumbull, Trumbull uh, down on the lower left. They reconstructed events to make eloquent pictures like stage tableaus and to give the participants an air of nobility as well as reality at the same time. The son of William Penn, Thomas, inherited the position of proprietor of the province of Philadelphia. He'd returned to England and he was a friend and sponsor of West's. In 1771, he commissioned this sober image uh, of an event that's supposed to have taken place on the banks of the Delaware River in 1683, when William Penn made a peace treaty with the chief of the Lenape tribe. There aren't any documents or descriptions, there's just legend. But the legend was so strong that it served as a symbol of honesty and tolerance in the American colonies. And Voltaire uh, called it the only treaty never sworn to and never broken. Uh, think on that, yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> the composition is a kind of cross between Agrippina and the death of Wolfe. I mean, Agrippina in that flanking pair of foreground groups and the shallow lineup of Penn's party in the middle, and Wolf, uh, in the uh, death of Wolf in the merchants and natives uh, who do the deal uh, in the center. West makes the exchange perfectly clear. Uh, the merchants offer cloth, and behind there is a map, which means map of the territory that the Indians will cede. West got more and more versatile as time went on. This is his large painting of a battle in which the English were that mopped up a French fleet in 1692. Louis XIV had sent ships <coughs> to prepare an invasion of England that would have led to a counter-revolution, putting a Catholic on the English throne. The French were foiled. 
The West adopts this high Baroque drama of the 17th century naval uh, battle pictures that he was familiar with, and his audience too. And later, West ended by getting every honor an artist could get in England, being tremendously productive and changing styles with the time. He became a full-blown romantic when the occasion called for it. The sketch, uh, down here on the right, gives an idea of what he intended better than the 25-foot wide finished version here at the top uh, 20 years later. This is the best picture I could take. This is how you see it in the Pennsylvania Academy. It was to be a sensational picture, not for church, but painted on spec as a traveling attraction that, you'd, uh, that would tour the cities uh, and would make money uh, from the sale of tickets and printed reproductions. A couple of lectures from now, we'll see how this system worked uh, for the grand master of apocalyptic spectacle, John, John Martin. The subject is literally apocalyptic. It comes from the book of Revelation. Um, here, as I looked and beheld a paled horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them, unto the fourth part, part of the earth, to kill with a sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Now, um, it's high time that we left all this excitement, turned the clock back 20 years, and returned uh, to the widow Agrippina. We left her having landed with her family, being greeted by the sorrowing Romans whom Tacitus describes so vividly. He writes that she then travels across Italy to Rome in a solemn procession. Tacitus says that the emperor, who he suggests ordered the poisoning of Germanicus by Piso, his man in Syria, and his wife, but the emperor made a public show of appearing grief-stricken. Tiberius sends army cohorts to accompany the 400-mile journey, and he sent tribunes and centurions to bear the ashes of Germanicus on their shoulders. He describes mourners lining the roads, weeping and wailing. The populations of towns all along the route, 400 miles, come to offer sacrifices. Once they arrive in Rome, the ashes are buried in the tomb of Augustus, and a simple funeral is held, so simple that it infuriates the citizens. Piso and his wife have so many accusers, including Agrippina, that the couple is recalled to Rome from Syria and put on trial by the Senate. Piso sees that he's likely to be convicted and commits suicide. And then, says Tacitus, two days were frittered away over this mockery of a trial, and Piso's wife, got off free. Agrippina's later history lasts only 14 more years, and it's not a happy tale. She lived in Rome for 10 years, a heroine to the people, but a thorn in the side of Tiberius, who she was sure had ordered the murder of her husband. He banished her to a tiny prison island off the Italian coast. He kept her children captive. He allowed Agrippina to die of starvation. When Tiberius himself died a few years later, his successor was a young man whom Roman historians described as being increasingly cruel and demented, that little boy whom West shows holding Agrippina's hand, Caligula, who would turn out to be the, so depraved that the senators and guards actually assassinated him, the first em emperor to die that way, the first of many. In short, the act that West chose to paint, um, Agrippina's return to Italy, uh, was not going to have a glorious outcome for Rome or for her. It was futile. Justice was not done. What he shows instead is an act that offers two aspects for us to admire. The piety displayed by Agrippina as a wife and mother and the courage and civic responsibility shown by her as a citizen. West staged and directed this scene to make the action unmistakable. He shows where Agrippina has come from, far away from the east. He has her landing in the official magnificence of a great Roman city, among a crowd of citizens bound to each other 
and to her by their grief and their anger at the loss that she and they have suffered. We see where she is going, past the shadowy portico of a, portico of a very large public building, symbolic of the power of empire, and on to a shadowy future. In sharp contrast to all this grandeur and commotion is the group of the widow and her family. Their colorless costumes isolate them from the common citizenry and unite them with each other. Their steps are slow. If this were an opera, the score would be marked Largo. In this picture, contrast is the heart of the matter. A woman who has lived virtuously, serving her husband and family, and serving Rome, is shown the one with, she's shown as the one with real strength. In contrast, the absent emperor is the most powerful man on earth, his power embodied in the magnificence all around, but we know he's guilty of weakness and cruelty. The spectacle here is Agrippina bringing home not only her husband, but also bringing the truth. And it's her intention to bring it all the way to the seat of power, to Rome. And we're invited to consider that like many other brave and truthful people, she will pay the price. In the next lecture, uh, other brave people paying the price, um, in a picture by West's protege and fellow American, John Trumbull. Ultimately, there is a happy outcome to this one. You're cordially invited. <laughs> Thank you.